and behaviour. But today I'm going to talk more generally about fisheries management in Australia, Indonesia and the United Arab Emirates, countries with different socio-political systems and cultures. But first, some po policy context. Now, sustainable development goals recently applied by the United Nations include goal 14, life below water. And there's a number of targets uh, that are included in that goal, but I've singled out two that are relevant to today's discussion. Um, by 2020, effectively regulate harvesting and end over fishing. Other challenges include managing fisheries to their maximum sustainable yield. But as I'll show later, uh, in order to determine maximum sustainable yield, you generally have to overfish. Another important target, sorry, another important target is uh, providing access to small scale artisanal fisheries. Um, this is particularly relevant to Indonesia, um, communities which include coastal communities to, which depend on fishing for their livelihoods. Australia's embraced uh, ecological, ecologically sustainable development as a key guiding principle and has applied that generally in fisheries management. Fisheries management embraces quantitative and biological sciences, but is fundamentally a social discipline aiming to control human behaviour. ESD raises the issue as to what is the best use of a fish um, to improve total quality of life. So if we look at conserving the community's resources, this underpins the common property nature of, of fisheries. If we look at ecological processes, this leads us to consider the uh, maintenance of ecosystem services. Um, but pivotally, how can you measure or evaluate total quality of your life? Um, Again, these are challenges for fisheries managers. Governments typically manage common property resources, such as most fisheries, on behalf of the community to hopefully optimise benefits to the community. They determine access and more recently allocation on behalf of the community. Um, access is the opportunity for identifiable sectors and sectors include uh, commercial, recreational, artisanal or indigenous and increasingly conservation. So use can be extractive in the case of, um, of, of fisheries or non-extractive in the case of say tourism or uh, conservation as part of a marine protected area. Allocation is the determination of how much for fish is distributed to each user group or sector. It encompasses both a process of determination and the unit of allocation. So it could be catch, as in weight of fish or effort, uh, number of uh, pots to catch uh, lobster, for example, or amount of net that you use. Importantly, with limited entry fisheries, allocation can be explicitly defined. And Australia and particularly New Zealand have embraced this uh, with great fervor. So you have um, individual transferable quotas for catches and effort units. And, and these can be determined by the market and allocated according to stock assessment uh, linked to sustainable targets. However, allocation is poorly defined for non-commercial sectors and, and therein uh, lies the issue with limited entry and its applicability to fisheries more generally. If we look at Indonesia, seafood is very important, uh, both in terms of economic benefits. Um, Indonesia is aiming to have seafood to contribute to 12% of its GDP um, by 2025. And it's very important socially, given the dependence of many coastal communities in this archipelagic nation uh, that are dependent on, on seafood for their livelihoods. Um, if you look at the consumption 50 kilograms per person of seafood per year, that compares with Australia, 25 kilograms per seafood per year and the UAE, a similar value. Um, but significantly, most fishing operations are 
subsistence or artisanal involving small boats. Illegal fishing or IUU is a big problem in Indonesia, which a, it abuts a number of other nations that are keen to access its fishery resources. And it's estimated that Indonesia loses about $4 billion worth of revenue each year to illegal fishing. So the government of Indonesia spent a lot of effort and time combating illegal fishing. But there are other issues. The two million or so small scale fishes are, are largely unregulated. They don't have licenses. They're not subject to rules and regulations as commercial fishes are in Australia. They have low levels of discards, primarily because every fish that they catch is used in some way. Um, although Indonesia is a large country, it has many, many different cultures and languages and customs which influence fishing, fisheries management. So in some areas, traditional fishery uh, is according to customary laws and that can lead to some conservative fishing practices, but by and large, fishery, fisheries are unregulated. They're devolved to the 499 municipalities across the archipelago and there are a lot of inconsistencies in the approach to fisheries management, poor data availability, and uh, other issues that affect the outcome of, uh, of fisheries management. But it's the second largest producer of seafood in the world. It produces uh, some 1 million tonnes of small pelagics, including scads and mackerel. It's the largest producer in the world of snapper. It's the largest producer in the world of tuna, and it's a significant producer of shrimp, although, as we'll see later, trawl fishing has been banned and that production now has been rapidly overtaken by uh, land-based aquaculture. The task of fisheries management in Indonesia, as I said, has been devolved to the 499 municipalities, but it's centralised in their Ministry for Marine Affairs and, and Fisheries, uh, involving some 10,000 public servants. Now, by contrast, the Australian Fisheries Management Authority uh, has about 200 public servants. So there's a lot of people involved in fisheries management. However, there's generally poor awareness of quantitative fisheries science and sustainable fisheries management. Uh, I've been involved in a number of capacity building programs with the ministry and with a number of uh, Indonesian universities, as you'll see from the, the picture here of, of two of those participants. They're holding a copy of my book on sustainable fisheries management for Indonesia. And part of the problem is how to manage uh, such a large country, such a disaggregate and dispersed population, uh, mainly with artisanal uneducated fishermen across um, a large area, which is effectively open access, except for large commercial fishing operations such as, uh, as tuna. There are some size limits and there are some nominal fisheries management areas um, but by and large, uh, fisheries in Indonesia are largely unregulated. The challenges for Indonesia include destructive fishing practices, which I'll go into a little bit more detail in the next few slides. Poor cold chain management, uh, that is relating to the general structure of fishing in, in artisanal fisheries such as Indonesia is that fisheries involve small family groups. They don't have the resources to invest in freezers and ice making machines. And so many of the fish which are, are caught are either consumed that day or wasted. I mentioned the fisheries are unregulated. Unre There's poor transport across the archipelago, which means that access to markets and profitable enterprises are out of reach of many Indonesians. Illegal fishing, particularly by foreign vessels, is, is problematic, as is institutional capacity and capability. So that is knowledge of resp effective responses to deal with fisheries management issues. Destructive fishing practices include blast fishing. Um, that's made effectively bombing uh, to stun fish, which are then gathered from the surface. Now, this is widespread in some areas of Indonesia. It's seen as an act of bravado by young men. So this is uh, one of the social elements that uh, can be 
uh, but be tackled by awareness raising campaign, but it is incredibly destructive. It's used for food fish and you'll see there's evidence of, of blast fishing practices in live fish markets uh, where you see distended ab abdomen and other evidence of uh, blast fishing. It's clearly dangerous to users as well. Uh, another, again, widespread fishing practice which is destructive is cyanide fishing. So this is used to uh, target the a largely illegal um, live aquarium trade to lucrative markets in Hong Kong, Taiwan uh, and China. So you use cyanide to, to stun fish which then are collected alive. Uh, they generally don't survive but those that do are then marketed illegally because they're going against many CITES provisions. Uh, but nonetheless, um, this results in extreme damage to to coral reefs. Occasionally they use 44 drums of, uh, of cyanide which uh, spread across whole reefs. So a combination of blast fishing and uh, poisoning um, is destroying a lot of habitat which is essential for the maintenance of fish populations which sustain coastal communities in Indonesia. So overfishing and illegal fishing is one threat but destructive fishing practices which destroy fish uh, fish habitat is, is a very great threat to Indonesia's um, livelihoods and well-being. Looking in a different uh, country context, this is uh, Palm Island, Dubai in the United Arab Emirates or the UAE and as you can see this is heavily modified coastal habitat. This exemplifies a number of artificial islands which have been built uh, across the UAE and Nearshore habitat uh, is also being modified with marinas and desalination plants and, and all manner of uh, coastal zone development. Added to that, uh, the UAE abuts the Arabian Gulf and the Indian Ocean via the Gulf of Oman and being a relatively confined body of water, um, the Gulf experiences extremes of, of temperature. Other issues include uh, extremes of salinity, um, given the propensity and uh, explosion of desalination plants for supply of fresh water in a water or steer country such as the UAE. It's a, it's a shallow gulf and added to that um, with increasing temperatures with climate change, we've seen a loss of, um, of reef habitat, particular particularly coral reef habitats, but also degradation of important nearshore nursery grounds, which support uh, many species of fish important to fisheries in the UAE. So dredging, desalination, sedimentation, pollution are, are current issues in the UAE. As with uh, Indonesia, there's general lack of capacity in fisheries science and marine ecology, uh, poor data availability, and many inappropriate management practices. I've already mentioned uh, coastal zone development, which is destructive to many species of fish habitat. And current policies in the OAE emphasise economic development rather than sustainability. And like the UAE and like Australia and like Indonesia, uh, responsibility for fisheries management is largely devolved to emirate or state level. UA fisheries are important though. Um, they represent traditionally traditional livelihoods which predate discovery of oil in the 30s. So uh, Emiratis were traditionally pearl divers, uh, fishers and traders. Uh, and they retain artisanal gear, um, mainly traps as you can see in this photograph, which are used to target mixed species fisheries. Uh, it's essentially open access with 6,000 vessels and more than 20,000 fishes. There's generally poor reporting and enforcement. Um, they target, as I said, mixed species, uh, generally groupers, emperors and Spanish mackerel. They tend to be the most important fisheries which are landed and marketed in the UAE. But uh, they're declining fisheries with many species dangerously overfished. Um, have relatively 
few regulations, uh, which include closed seasons and some size limits. Um, uh, but in general, uh, fisheries are seen as, uh, as overfished and that has focused attention on aquaculture to replace uh, seafood that has been largely depleted by overfishing. If we look at um, culturally important species, this is hamor, um, which is a, a culturally important species, but widely distributed. It occurs in Australia, it occurs in Indonesia. It's preferred by UAE consumers, but it's susceptible to overfishing because populations are localised near coral reefs. Coral reefs in themselves have been depleted. In UAE has lost most of its uh, coral reefs to, to climate change and to increasing temperature. It has moderate productivity, that is moderate natural mortality, growth rates and, and fecundity. Juvenile stages occur in estuaries and other near shore habitats, which are, are vulnerable to hab habitat modification. And it's currently the preferred species for aquaculture. So because of its importance to, to Emiratis, it's seen as an opportunity to grow it locally. Previously, they had attempted to culture this species for uh, restocking, uh, but that hasn't been successful. UAE and, and JCU are embarking on a, on a partnership to develop their marine resources and what they called the, the blue economy. And elements of this uh, are addressing some of the current issues. So uh, integrated coastal zone management, focusing on habitat restoration and protection, uh, blue engineering for future coastal development. So if you're going to introduce built environments such as artificial islands and uh, marinas and ports and so on, take that as an opportunity to add habitat and to maintain essential ecosystem services rather than destroying that habitat, which is important to, to fisheries and to the general well-being of Emiratis. Develop fisheries management based on sustainable harvest strategies for key species underpinned by uh, relatively robust stock assessments. Develop aquaculture for food security necessarily that'll be involving land-based systems because of the scarcity of, uh, of water available to uh, aquaculturists in the harsh uh, desert environment of the UAE. Develop adaptive responses to climate change and develop capacity for, uh, for building the capacity of future managers. So develop capacity in fishery science, in fundamental marine ecology, in integrated coastal zone management. And JCU is uh, doing that in partnership with the UAE government and with the UAE knowledge sector. It's also helping to develop a center of excellence in advanced marine science and technology, which you can see uh, in the photograph on the top there, it's located in the Emirate of Umm al Quwain, some 100 kilometres across the Gulf to Iran and adjacent to the Straits of Hormuz. So, an ambitious undertaking to develop a centre of excellence. In the bottom photograph is a gentleman whose name is Essa. He is the key contact for JCU, linking through to the Ministry of Food Security. And his aspiration is to increase the production of aquaculture tenfold from its current production of 3,000 tonnes to about 30,000 tonnes within 10 years. So UAE has a lot of stretch targets and there are many issues that remain to be addressed and, and JCU will be playing a key role in assisting uh, developed capacity for the UAE to, to meet those challenges. Now turning to Australian fisheries. Australian fisheries have some 14,000 or so commercial fishes, including state-based and Commonwealth fishes. Uh, almost all of those are limited entry. In other words, they have to have the license to operate. And commercial fisheries are generally highly regulated, including cargo strategies uh, with definable targets and decision rules, which uh, regulate uh, harvests, 
and other input and output controls. They have a mix of uh, input controls which regulate efforts, so uh, number of pots or amount of gear or amount of time uh, available or where and where you can fish, and output controls which include catch and size limit. Key species are subject to generally uh, robust stock assessments, uh, but there are many other species for which um, we only have sparse information. Importantly, there are some 5 million or so recreational fishes. Uh, I mentioned 2 million artisanal fishes in Indonesia, so compares with the 5 million or so recreational fishes in Australia, which are unlimited entry. So there's no limit on the number of participants. Um, importantly, 50% of the recreational fishing effort is undertaken by about 15% of, uh, of participants. So those participants that uh, actively target uh, preferred species and take out most of the recreational catch. Recreational fisheries in Australia include input controls, including closed seasons, closed areas, and output controls, size limits. Um, and there are also bag limits on certain species, but there's in effect no limit on the on the take given that there's unlimited participation. There's generally poor information on catches every 10 years or so. There are national recreational fisheries surveys, but uh, by and large, compared with commercial fisheries, uh, which require fairly precise um, information on catches and effort, the information from recreational fishes in Australia is, is generally poor. Particularly for inshore fisheries, recreational fishers can take significant shares of the resource. And by, by what I mean by significant shares is uh, more than 25%, for example, whiting, snapper, crabs, mulloway, and, and other species, um, including lobster and abalone. Recreational licenses are required only for Victoria and New South Wales, the states of Australia, and some fisheries in, the, in Tasmania. So the point here is that recreational fishing in Australia is essentially open access uh, and can potentially take a large amount of the share of the resource and in some cases potentially threaten the viability of, of some fisheries. Now, this exemplifies the political potency of recreational fishing in Australia. It's taken from a uh, recreational fishing magazine, uh, of which there are many in Australia, and it underlines the slogan, I fish and I vote, and recreational fishers have been particularly active uh, in contesting uh, marine protected areas, which uh, include no-take areas. Um, but they're also been particularly active in contesting access to the resource by commercial fishers. Um, in Australia, um, major population centres are located on the coast and recreational fishing is a very important activity. As I mentioned, 5 million recreational fishes. So social elements apply generally across the three case study countries that I'm talking about today. So fisheries management is more aligned to sociology than biology determining factors which influence human behaviour and addresses concerns about access to the resource. And as Lynn Ostrom emphasised in her Nobel Prize winning um, work on common property resources, she pointed out that natural resource management tends to be more sustainable and supported by communities if local people participate actively in resource governance. So Australia uh, has, going, has been going down the path of co-management, that is actively involving sector groups in determining access and allocation. Um, but in Australia, there is still asymmetry and political power between recreational and commercial fishers, and that has translated into outcomes which affect access and allocation of the resource. So many bays and inlets around Australia are now closed to commercial fishing. 
Now turning to community-based management, which um, is an important conduit to sustainable fisheries management, um, given some of the social elements. It involves determining secure access, so clearly defined boundaries and rights of sector groups. How are these determined? And in particular, education awareness raising. Now, although there have been some issues with recreational fishing in Australia, um, through awareness raising campaigns, we've seen uh, successful campaigns run through recreational fishing organisations and the media, leading to largely conservative fisheries management practice such as tag and release, uh, compliance with bag and size limits. And, and this is generally widespread. There's a lot of peer pressure in Australia to combat illegal fishing by recreational fishers, which they see as a threat to their own access uh, to the resource. So in general, Education and awareness raising is pivotal to raise community awareness about the need to protect habitat and to undertake responsible fishing. These include rules and regulations that limit our access to the resource, such as closures and rules that suit the local conditions. So looking at gear, non-destructive gear, lack, not using fine mesh gear. So in Indonesia, for example, education and awareness is going to be important to address destructive fishing practices such as bombing and poisoning. And, and that's um, one of the ways in which uh, that can be eliminated. Conflict resolution, particularly between commercial and recreational fishers, but also commercial and recreational fishing against uh, versus con conservation groups and indigenous groups. We've seen conflict uh, resolution in Indonesia where Commercial fishing by trawlers in nearshore habitats using fine mesh gear has resulted in um, a threat to the livelihoods of artisanal fishers because they're taking juvenile fish and fish more generally that otherwise would be a food source. In Australia, we've seen the separation of recreation, recreational and commercial fishes by closures, so uh, recreational fishing only areas, and that has dissipated a lot of the uh, tension between commercial and recreational fishes. In uh, Indonesia, and, and also to a lesser extent in the UAE, uh, traditional wisdom linked to evidence-based knowledge, I think is a very powerful tool, which potentially linked to education and awareness raising can raise awareness of uh, sustainable fishing practices and the need to maintain and protect uh, important nearshore habitat. And cooperatives for in infrastructure, I mentioned in Indonesia that fishing is largely undertaken by small, largely family groups. They don't have access to infrastructure such as freezing, ice making facilities, and therefore they forego more profitable activities, uh, access to markets that uh, would lead to perhaps improve livelihoods and perhaps reduce the pressure on the resource by um, maintaining incomes, but with uh, less volume of fish extraction. So community-based management um, across Australia, UAE and Indonesia, I think is an important pathway to sustainable fisheries management and, and habitat protection. Gender issues are particularly important, um, especially in Indonesia, where the family groups that I mentioned, um, women are particularly responsible for post-harvest activities. So that's processing and marketing. They might uh, run the roadside stalls to, to sell the fish. But women are particularly important, again, in Indonesia because of their role in awareness raising, um, regardless of the country, awareness of the need for habitat protection and sustainable fisheries management is required. Um, but what information is available and how is that dispersed? And uh, women, as I have mentioned, are important in developing pathways to sustainable fisheries management and ecologically sustainable development of fisheries.
Here is some data from, uh, from Eastern Indonesia. Um, they're, they're typically sparse data uh, and they map the yield of fish measurable as revenue in Indonesian rupiah against fishing effort. Now this is uh, a typical example. As you increase fishing effort, in this case it's fishing trips, then you catch more fish. Uh, that's obvious. Uh, but as you increase effort, you reach a threshold where the surplus of growth and reproduction over total mortality, that's natural mortality and fishing mortality is exceeded. And that means that uh, the fishery, the yield from fisheries decline uh, to a point where the uh, revenue from the fish fishing operation meets the cost. As you can see from this graph, the cost of fishing increases in a largely linearly fashion. So as you take more fishing, you, you use more fuel, you might employ more people and you reach a break even point after which it's no longer profitable to go fishing. And this is the issue with maximum sustainable yield. You can see there's five data points there um, and they're fitted to um, what we call in fishery science, a surplus production curve. And in order to determine that maximum sustainable yield, you have to exceed it. Uh, as you can see in 2004 and 2005, it's exceeded the maximum sustainable yield. And it's very hard to go back um, to levels which are, represent the maximum sustainable yield. And that generally tracks a pathway to, to overfishing. Uh, in, in Australia, Commonwealth fishery Fisheries are managed to maximum economic yield, which you can see in that graph is the maximum distance between revenue and cost of fishing. And maximum economic yield is generally less than maximum sustainable yield, so it's more sustainable. Most fisheries, even in Australia, which has advanced capacity in fishery science and management have poor data availability. So in Australia, we have uh, very good information for relatively few fish fisheries, but we also have some access to, to information. And here's an example. Um, if we can make some judgments about uh, fisheries through a risk assessment. So what are the likelihood of a uh, particular hazard occurring and what's the impact of that, that hazard? So if we take Indonesian trawl fisheries, which have been problematic, uh, red represents a high risk, that it is, it has high likelihood and high impact. So on this slide, we can see there's a large number of uh, unregistered vessels. There's too many trawlers, they're targeting uh, they're using fine mesh nets, which take uh, juveniles as well as uh, indiscriminately um, take fish that could be important to nearshore communities. They are coming uh, close to shore, which um, is where artisanal and traditional fishes generally operate. And increasingly with the growth of aquaculture in Indonesia, uh, they're targeting uh, fish for uh, aqu aqua feed. The fuel subsidy uh, introduced by the Indonesian government is encouraging greater participation. And so this represents a high risk. Now there's other issues such as turtle bycatch, but that can be controlled with turtle exclusion devices. There are discards, um, or, which don't generally occur in trawl fisheries in Indonesia. And uh, there are degradation of, of benthic habitats. Um, you know, in a trawl fishing, uh, that's a less of an issue than some of the destructive fishing practices, which I referred to earlier. Now, for many species, you can also make some judgments about productivity and susceptibility. And this information is available <clears throat> for many species through fishbase.org, and they provide basic biological information, uh, growth, fecundity, mortality. So if we use the example of um, uh, the hamor or karapu as it's called in Indonesia or rock cod as it's called uh, or greasy cod or estuary cod as it's called in Australia, 
uh, we can uh, determine that it's going to be susceptible to overfishing because we know that populations are localised near coral reefs where they can be targeted by line fishes or by uh, net fishes or gill nets. And so it's vulnerable to spatial depletion. But it has moderate productivity, so relatively high natural mortality. So the higher the natural mortality, the greater the productivity. So species such as uh, squid uh, and shrimp or prawns have, have high rates of natural mortality, so they, um, they recover very quickly from, from fishing. Um, the hamor has a relatively uh, high growth rate, uh, has a relatively high fecundity, so it can recover from fishing, unlike less productive sharks, uh, unlike less productive species such as sharks, for example. Uh, the juvenile stages occur in estuaries and other near shore habitats, so vulnerable to habitat de degradation or modification. And this is clearly an issue uh, in Indonesia, but particularly the UAE, where we've seen uh, substantial habitat modification. So overfishing is one thing, but habitat degradation is, is far more serious because uh, you're disrupting the life cycle of these species. So is limited entry required for sustainable fisheries management? So herein lies the tension in fisheries management. We've seen that for open access fisheries, um, rent is effectively dissipated. So fishing continues until profits go to zero. So this is the tragedy of the commons. Uh, people want to keep fishing because if they don't, someone else will go fishing. And so, Worldwide, we've seen fisheries decline because of this problem. Uh, there are other issues, as I've, as I've already highlighted, for nearshore fisheries with habitat degradation. But this is a more general issue which relates to, to limited entry. So why should some users have priority over others? Why should commercial fisheries, uh, particularly for valuable fisheries such as rock lobster or abalone in Australia, why should uh, some fishers have access to this resource uh, and, and not others? Now, as I've already said, recreational fishing fisheries, uh, recreational fishers have access to this, but they don't have the right to sell fish. So they are restricted in Australia from, from selling fish uh, without a commercial license. So, the community has secure access to sustainable supplies of seafood. And this is a social good. This is something that without commercial fishing, consumers that don't uh, have opportunities to go out and fish for themselves, they have access to sustainable and importantly safe supplies of seafood. So limited entry has some consequences. But is recreational or artisanal social value greater than the economic value of commercial fishing? Well, in some cases, clearly, even in Australia, that's true because uh, important commercial fishing fisheries have been closed uh, in the bays and inlets uh, near major population centres around Australia. So governments have made judgments on behalf of the community that the greatest good of managing those fishing fisheries in bays and inlets is that recreational fishers would derive a greater benefit, all things considered. So they're trading off a social benefit for a commercial benefit. But ecosystem-based management includes spatial management, particularly when you're looking at, at habitat protection. And MPAs allocate fisheries to conservation, but MPAs have relatively limited applicability in fisheries management. Um, they protect territorial reef fish, which could include the hamor or the rock cod, or other sedentary species, which can include uh, abalone or rock lobster, for example. Uh, so MPAs in Australia, their main objective is to conserve biodiversity and they play an important role. Indonesia has 20 million hectares, nominally, uh, dedicated to MPAs, 
and the UAE has marine protected areas, but they're generally not enforced and uh, habitat degradation is, is still an issue. Has there been progress in access and allocation? Um, Australia is actively addressing access and allocation issues in, in fisheries. Um, South Australia has allocated shares of popular species, whiting, snapper, garfish, lobster, blue crabs, abalone to recreational fishes. There's also a nominal allocation to indigenous fishes. So in Australia, South Australia has gone further than many states in Australia to recognise formally uh, an allocation to recreational fishes as a share of the resource. But what happens if recreational fishes take more than that share? How are you going to reduce the impact on, on fisheries so that they are sustainable? Well, in considering that, the government would buy shares of the resource back from the commercial fishers which participate in those fisheries and have formal shares allocated to them. So there would be a redistribution of those shares from the commercial sector to the recreational sector. I'm not sure how that's going to work in practice. Um, this is still work in progress. If you were going to do that, the weight of fish stock is the obvious unit to allocate across sectors. So you would allocate a certain number of tonnes annually subject to a harvest strategy, which would be responsive to uh, yardsticks of performance um, of sustainability determined by formal stock assessments. Uh, or it might include numbers for high value species such as lobster and abalone. So, bag limits for uh, these species are strictly controlled. Uh, you can catch two lobsters per day per person um, if you hold a license as a recreational fisher uh, in Tasmania and five abalone and, and that's more or less equivalent across states in, in Australia. But few data are available to evaluate extractions. A proportion of the allocated quota of southern bluefin tuna, critically endangered species, or um, stringently controlled um, through the Conservation Council for Conservation of uh, Southern Bluefin Tuna worldwide. Um, but what about charter boat operators that take paying tourists out to catch southern bluefin tuna? There could be a significant amount of tuna taken by recreational, including charter boat operators. Social metrics are not included or evaluated in management plans, um, but the management plans include aspirations to balance economic, environmental and social benefits um, in, in fisheries management. But values differ among sectors. Um, clearly, commercial fishers uh, value economic outcomes, um, conservationists environment, value environmental and uh, recreational fishers value the social experience afforded by recreational fishing. So what is the best use of a fish? You can catch a fish and sell it. If you're a commercial fisher, you can catch it for fun or food for your family. If you're a recreational fisher, you can catch it for food for your family. If you're a subsistence or artisanal fish, fisher, you can uh, grow it on land, having taken it from the ocean or, or from the freshwater stream and, and fatten it up for sale. If you're an aquaculturalist, or you can look at it in its natural habitat if you're a tourist. Uh, and in some cases, you can pay for that. So there's no single metric that can be used to determine optimal use. Um, and, and Australia is actively working through how it, it can balance up potentially competing needs uh, for, again, community benefit managed by governments for the benefit of the community. It depends on the species, the jurisdiction and the socio-political socio context. And that varies um, uh, across states of Australia. It varies across countries uh, within individual emirates in the UAE and within individual provinces and, and municipalities in, in Indonesia. Socio-political factors are dynamic, they change. Uh, 
baby boomers such as myself, uh, when they retire, they might want to get a boat and go fishing. And so they'll be vociferous advocates for the rights of recreational fishing. Indonesia's and UAE's priorities are food security and they're um, documented in, in their current policies. Australia's policies objectives are centered on ecologically sustainable development, which includes uh, necessarily social elements. And Australian commercial fisheries management policies prioritize economic value. But to manage fisheries for ecological sustainable development requires an effective integration of social, environmental and economic factors. And this remains to be done to optimize community benefits. So this is very much work in progress. So is limited entry a prerequisite for sustainable fisheries? Well, Limited entry, as I've pointed out, really exists in practice, but limited entry certainly is a prerequisite for profitable commercial fisheries, uh, as, as I hope I've demonstrated. But there's a lot more work to do to incorporate social values in mainstream fisheries management to meet ESG objectives. Uh, and that, ladies and gentlemen, concludes my presentation. I hope that it's been informative and I welcome any questions. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Paul. Um, we have a question already here from um, Andrew Chin. I'll just uh, give, give him access to um, ask his own question. Thank you. Andrew. Hey, Paul, how are you doing? I'm doing well, yeah. Uh, good, good. Head is just at the level of the water. <laughs> um, thanks, mate. Really interesting um, presentation. Um, in several of the parts where you're talking about fisheries in Indonesia, um, I, th I, I got the sense you were dance, dancing around the different that solutions might be really quite complex. So I'm just wondering if you've come across any good examples of polycentric governance uh, in Indonesia. Um, and if you have seen those examples, um, what you think makes them work? Look, uh, thank you, Andrew, and that's a very good question. Um, you know, it's quite depressing um, going to Indonesia, going to the fish markets, uh, seeing the extent and damage at close hand of destructive fishing practices, uh, your own interest in sharks, uh, you'd be dismayed at the impact on, on sharks through shark finning, through uh, illegal fishing, through destructive fishing practices. But to answer your question, um, uh, community engagement in some uh, circumstances has been quite effective, um, particularly mediated through NGOs and NGOs have been and are quite active in Indonesia, particularly in Bali, where uh, they're seeing opportunities to develop ecotourism experiences, um, tourists in in visiting Bali, they're dismayed at the amount of plastic litter, they're dismayed at the um, uh, amount of pollution, they're dismayed at, um, in some cases, in the intensity of fishing, but they like to have access to clean, safe seafood. So Indonesians, uh, through community groups and through engaging with uh, provincial agencies in Bali, have, have gone a fair way down the path of uh, recognising the need for awareness raising and for community engagement for responsible fishing practices. Um, there are some instances of, uh, of ecotourism um, um, which uh, include sustainably caught uh, seafood and promote sustainable, sustainably caught seafood, but there's still lots of work to do. Uh, if you look at, say, the Raja Ampat uh, archipelago, which is a stunning World Heritage listed um, uh, area of coast um, off eastern Indonesia, it's still afflicted by uh, by bombing and by poisoning. And so, uh, potentially, ecotourism could be a pathway that says, "Look, uh, our livelihoods and our potential work employment opportunity for young people in Raja Ampat has been threatened by your destructive fishing practices, so cease and desist. Mm -hmm. um, so education and awareness is pivotal and the knowledge sector has got a role to play, um, but so, the, so has the community and uh, driving that through effective governance uh, at community level. Mm 
So I, I hope that's given you some um, information in relation to your question, Andrew. Yeah, no. Um, interesting to see the tourism as emerging as a driver for this. Mm. Um, I think there's opportunity there, but it's also fraught with complexity. Uh, thanks, mm. thanks, Paul. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Paul? If not, we'll, we're getting close to five anyway, so we might leave it there. Thank you so much for your time and effort on that, Paul. Um, we really appreciate your expertise and, and for giving us um, your time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jan. Thanks for the opportunity. I hope it was informative.